verses from a version of the Bible called The Message in Psalms 139. God, investigate my life, get all the facts firsthand. I am an open book to you, even from a distance you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and want to get back, I'm never out of, out of your sight. I, you know everything I'm going to say before I even start the first sentence. I look behind me and you are there, then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit? To be out of your sight. If I climb the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, Oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed uh, in the light. In fact, darkness isn't even dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you are breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in Adoration, what a creation. You may, you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly oh, how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing to into something. Like an open book, 
you watched me grow from conception. conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I had even lived one day. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. God, I will never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and live always with you. God bless the reading of his words. is anointed at Bethany. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. 
He did many miracles, like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were getting ready to celebrate a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses, when God brought his people out of Egypt. Two days before the Passover, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. Hey, 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 come on in! A man who had previously had leprosy. While Jesus was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful jar of expensive perfume. She broke the jar open and poured perfume over Jesus' head. Jesus' disciples were upset when they saw this. They said, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. What'd you do that for? So they scolded the woman. Ah, uh, hold on there. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered. To help us remember this Bible story and to be more like Jesus, Gus is going to teach us how to draw Jesus. So get your paper crayons and markers ready and let's draw with Gus. Hey friends, it's Gus. I'm excited to draw with you today. Let's draw my favorite person. Let's draw Jesus. First, we're gonna make a big U right in the middle of the paper, like this. Now let's make his nose. Near the top, do a little line across. Then, do a line down right here on this side. Do another line on the other side, but this one's a little bit longer. And now we get to do a big sideways U to connect the two lines. Next, let's do his eyes. On each side of his nose, do a big circle. And do a smaller circle inside of those. <laughs> Color him in, just like that. Oh, I wanna make his mustache next. Okay, do a curved line out from each side of his nose. Then connect those with some U's across underneath his nose. And to show the top of his beard, do a little line from the side of his face to his mustache. I'll put two little lines here too. Now let's make his smile now. Go right under his mustache and do two curved lines. And color it in. Now from the bottom of his chin, do two little swirly lines up. Great! We made his beard. Go to the side of his face right here to make his ear. Just do a little C with a little tiny Y inside. Perfect! And right under his ear, do three poofy U's on the side of his face for some of his hair. Now let's do his eyebrows. Just make two skinny rectangles on top of his eyes. We can color those in. Oh, there's just one more thing to do. We need to finish his hair. To start, put a dot right there above his eyebrow. Start on that dot and do a line to the top line over here and a curved line up and around there. Let's make two more bumps here. One, two. And with this last bump, keep the line going all the way across to here so there's a little space between these two points. Start at this top point and do one bump up and over, and do another bump up and over, and one more bump up and around here. Go ahead and go to this point here in the middle and do a long curved line down. We did it! Thanks for drawing Jesus with me. See you next time.
Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Tracy. So the Apostles' Creed, we just went over it. Um, I wanted to start my message this morning looking at uh, one of Jody's uh, final slides from last week. So if we can put that up. Uh, Jody gave this little, quick little slide, and, it's, and it talks about the free Methodist approach to doctrine, to understanding this, the Bible. And essentially, the idea is there's, there's three postures that we like to hold as free Methodists. And I wanted to go over this because this kind of sets the tone for the Apostles' Creed. So, as free Methodists, we believe that in essential beliefs, deep water, we have unity. Now, essential beliefs would essentially be uh, the beliefs that are required for a salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. So, what is required to have a good salvation relationship with Jesus? And the answer that free Methodists give is the Apostles' Creed. We believe that if someone can, can say or know or understand the Apostles' Creed and say, yes, I believe all of those things, we believe that that person will have a salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. Next, non-essential beliefs, essentially everything else. Uh, as free Methodists, we... Uh, understand that there are a lot of different ways to read this book and come up with different answers to how to live out this relationship with Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? That's what this book is for. And we understand that through time uh, and even today, there's a lot of different ways of understanding how exactly to live out the details of a relationship with Jesus. We believe that in the details, the shallow water, we have a lot of freedom. That means that uh, we acknowledge that there's a lot of ways to understand this book, and we want to make sure they're not, we're not excluding people just because they have a different understanding than us. We want to make sure that uh, we have freedom together. Lastly, in all our beliefs as Free Methodists, we want to show love. We believe that the most important commandment in Scripture is love. And so no matter what we believe, no matter how we express those beliefs, it has to be expressed as free Methodists with love. So, that brings us to the Apostles' Creed, these deep water issues. And as Pastor Jody and I were discerning from the Lord, how do we lead our church in this whole COVID stuff? We kind of had a nudge that said, well, go back to the basics. Go back to the source. Go back to what is most important. And so we went to the Apostles' Creed and said, wow, this, this is really good material here, A. And B, we oftentimes don't think about the basics very often. Sometimes when we get caught up in COVID and the world around us and the craziness we find ourselves in, sometimes we can forget and going back to the basics can be really, really helpful. So the goal with this series is threefold. First, we want to help us get clear and have this unity that we want around these deep water issues. We want to look carefully at why these deep water issues matter. Why do these statements in the Apostles' Creed matter so much? Why have they stood for thousands of years? Why? And we want to understand how those beliefs should change our relationship with Jesus each day. So we believe that the Apostles' Creed should shape how we live and act day in and day out. So the first statement we're going to look at this morning from the Apostles' Creed is regarding God the Father. The statement reads, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Okay, so I initially thought, okay, that's a really short statement, not a whole lot there. Maybe I'll just add the next one to it and we'll compress it in. And then as I was preparing, the Lord gave me, uh, well, quite a bit about this little statement. 
First of all, as I was researching and figuring out, okay, so where exactly can we find this in scripture? Um, there, I mean, God, the Father, the Creator is everywhere. So the, the passages I'm going to pick are just an example. There's a lot more than the ones I've picked. Um, the, the Old Testament especially is full of this language of God, the Creator, God, the Sustainer, God Almighty, especially the Psalms is just full of it. Um, So we're going to look at just a few passages. Genesis 1 is going to be our first passage. And Genesis 1 is the creation story, right? So the creation story talks about how God, uh, God went through a process in creating the world as we know it. So he had light and dark, and then he had sky and water, and then he had dry ground appear in the water, And then he started putting plants, and he started putting animals, and he started putting air animals, and water animals, and land animals. And then, uh, after he did all of that, after he had all the animals, then he did something special. Verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God is clearly the initiator of creation, according to scripture. Next, we move to John 17. John 17, and we're going to look at verses 20 to 26. John 17, 20 to 26 is a prayer by Jesus. And you want to take special note of the language he uses here regarding the Father. Okay? So, verse 20 says, Jesus is praying for his disciples. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me. Notice these verbs, right? What did God do? He sent Jesus. The Father sent Jesus and is giving glory. That they may be as one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be, me, may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So notice the verbs there, sent, given, and loved. Next, James 1, verse 17. James 1, 17 reminds us, so Jesus prays to his father, and he talks about the acts of the father, giving, sending, loving. And then James reminds us, in verse 17, it says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So we know that God so far is the creator. We know that he does not change. We know that he is a giver and a sender of good gifts and a love of love. And then lastly, we're going to look in Revelation 1 verse 8. And here God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we have these three words. We have creator, we have father, and we have almighty. I want want you to tune into those because those are the important parts of this creed. So why are these three words important? Well, do a thought exercise with me. 
Uh, last night, this was a little more dangerous because, you know, it's kind of, man, it gets dark out. We were done church at around 7.15. You walk outside, it's dark. It, that's, that's just, I'm st- I got to get used to that. That's how Canada is. But uh, it, was, it was tired. So we, we're going to do this exercise. We close our eyes. Uh, Saturday night, a little more dangerous. You might fall asleep. But if you need to sleep, that's okay. We're going to close our eyes. So we're going to close our eyes and we're going to imagine the world. Okay? So think world. We're going to imagine the world. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine a world that was created by chance. So out of chance, an explosion happens. And then out of chance, a planet happens to be formed. And then as if for no reason at all, but somehow it happened, life comes on that planet and then there just happens to be life that, that is viable and, and morphs and evolves into different life. And eventually that life morphs and evolves into sentient life and you get humans. So that's how the world was created. Now imagine a world where there's no purpose, right? The world is just a chance. It could have happened, it could not have. It could have equally not exist. What is the point of existence in a world like that? What is the point of being in a world where you're just a random mathematical probability? Imagine a world with no anchor for morality. Why would humans be any more valuable than trees or rocks or fish or cows? I mean, all of us were created by chance. We all had the same mathematical probability to exist. Why would one be more valuable than the other? Imagine a world, this chance world, where the end of life is death, and you have no idea what's on the other side. Is it static? Is it, is it just a black screen? Is it just the lights, lights just click off? The movie's done, nothing else, no after credits. All right, open your eyes. I want you to tell me what you're feeling. Give me some words. Lost. Lost. What else? Meaningless. Meaningless. Dead. Dead. Worthless. Worthless. Empty. Empty. Yeah. As I was led to this thought exercise by the Lord, I had a profound sense of this empty purposelessness and just going through time because, well, because nothing. Just because. And I began to think, imagine how hard, if, if that was your understanding of the world, imagine how hard it would be to keep going when COVID happens, or when your spouse dies, or when cancer shows up, or when life throws a curveball at you, or you have a miscarriage. Now, put those heavy things into a world that is that empty and that hopeless and that lost. It really made me uh, understand the importance that having an almighty creator, good father, God, is. That is super important. And it also reminded me, oh right, (laughs) we got to go tell them. Most of the people around us are living in that world. That is their day-to-day life. I could barely, I I was, the Lord gave me that exercise as I was falling asleep. (laughs) I mean, he usually gives me sermons as I'm about to fall asleep. And, and he gave me that. And I remember being wide awake for a while after going, wow, A, uh, that's terrifying. And B, I can't imagine going through all the stuff that I've gone through or that my family's been through without the hope that I have. Without the hope that I have. So we're going to look at these three aspects of God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Why do they give us this hope? Why do they give us this purpose? So first of all, God the creator. God the creator gives us reason to exist. Right? God the creator gives a reason for the order that exists. 
This idea that intelligent design, the world is not a random mathematical equation of atoms banging into each other and happening to explode in the right way and then we happen to just show up because of the right exact stuff. No. We were intentionally made. Intentionally made. Being the result of cosmic chance removes so much meaning from life. Being created means that we have a purpose. God the creator gives us a reason to value life and creation. Consider with me the difference between the Grand Canyon. All right, so think, so Grand Canyon, right? Really big. It's really cool. I haven't been yet. Uh, I know a lot of you, some of you have. Grand Canyon, really cool, really big river, kind of down the middle kind of thing. You, you know, it's big. How much meaning is in the Grand Canyon? How much meaning is in the Grand Canyon? Not, not very much. Now, Mount Rushmore. How much meaning is in Mount Rushmore? If you've ever visited both of those places, the Grand Canyon has like maybe a little plaque. I, I don't know, does it have, does it have, I, I feel like Mount Rushmore, they have, they have an entire, like you go in there, there's videos and there's like people presenting stuff and, and then, and then there's, there's this whole center, you have to pay money to get in just to, just to see stuff and, and take pictures. You could go to Mount Rushmore multiple times and learn something new every time. Right? There's meaning in Mount Rushmore. What meaning is in the Grand Canyon that just happened? I mean, yeah, it's really cool, but it just, it just happens to be there. There's no meaning. There's not near the value as something that was intentionally created for a purpose. So think about your kid's artwork. I don't know about you, but when Marcus was really small, he would give us nice little art, right? He'd just draw on things and, and give us art. So you think about Marcus's art on a napkin at dinner time. And then you think about the napkin that has pizza sauce on it from wiping my face. Which one of those two things has meaning? Even if Marcus's looks the same as the one that has pizza sauce, <laughs> even if it looks the same, it has meaning because he made it. I may not understand it, I may not know what it is, but he made it and he gave it to me. He said, Dad, I made this for you. And that's when you go, awesome, son, thank you so much. Right? Design gives purpose and meaning. Creator God also gives us an image to bear and to love in others, right? Genesis says, God made mankind in his image. Men and women made in the image of God. That gives value, inherent value. It should change everything about how you interact with people, right? If if people around you have no inherent value, if they're, just, if they're just kind of the same cosmic accident as you are, well, it's really easy to write them off. It's really easy to disregard them. It's really easy to not forgive them. It's really easy to go against them. Think about that person who posted that thing on Facebook, that thing that got you really angry. Image of God. They have the image of God in them. Think about that person who you despise. Maybe even that person who got COVID. Image of God. That should change everything about how we interact with one another as image bearers. We should never forget that no matter where you stand on political stuff, no matter where you stand on stuff in our world like COVID, no matter where you stand, we all bear the image. And as Christians, we need to remember that because so often we get caught up in the fight. We get caught up in the chaos. We get caught up in, in this. And we forget to take a step back and go, oh right, God created that person the same as they created me. Image bearer. How you understand that changes how you treat the image. Right? The napkin with pizza sauce, where does it go? Right in the garbage, right? Just straight in the garbage. The napkin with Marcus's drawing that looks like pizza sauce, where does it go? Goes on the fridge. Right? 
The fact that it was created and has purpose means I treat it differently. I treat it differently. The next two words I'm going to put together because I think they work, they go hand in hand together. So we have God the Almighty and we have God the Good Father. So these two words go together. We have an Almighty Good Father. So an Almighty Good Father provides a refuge or a shelter in times of crisis. Remember that when, when life comes, when COVID shows up, when, when stuff is here, when life is going bonkers around us, scripture reminds us that God is in control. He's all powerful. He's bigger than our problems. Imagine with me praying to a God who wasn't good, right? So let's say you have a, a, a physical ailment and you're praying to a God and you're not sure if they're good or not. In fact, they might be bad. You don't know. What kind of prayer? That, that feels, I don't know about you, that feels really dangerous. That, that's like, I'm going to put my prayer on the table and I'm just going to leave it there and I'm going to back away slowly because I'm not sure if God's good or not. What happens if you pray to a God that's not almighty? I have this problem in my life. I have cancer. I have whatever. And you pray to a God and you're like, ah, I'm not really sure if he can fix that. I'm not really sure uh, if he's powerful enough. I don't know. What happens to our prayers then? They become really, really kind of pointless, don't they? To pray to a God that is not almighty feels like a futile effort. The goodness and the almightiness of God reminds us that there is a plan bigger than ourselves. I don't know about you, but when I think of the world around me, um, knowing that God is in control and he has a plan that's bigger than me, that really, like, that takes a huge load off, right? If it's all on me, if, if everything, everything banks on me doing it well or doing it right or doing it perfectly, man, imagine the, like, that's a ton of pressure, especially when stuff doesn't go the way I want, <laughs> which is quite often. So having a God, having a God that has a plan allows me, <sighs> allows me to breathe. God Almighty and God the Father gives us an answer. That plan gives us an answer. God's plan of salvation gives us an answer to the question, what comes after death? What comes after death? We know, we know that even if the worst possible thing happens here on earth, even if we, even if we have the worst disease and we die, right? The worst possible outcome, the worst disease and we die, we still know that God's plan is bigger than that. God's plan is bigger than that. Death is not the end of the plan. In fact, in many ways, it's the beginning of the plan. God has a plan after death. Have you ever noticed um, those elderly saints, those, those men and women of the church who have a really, really close relationship with Jesus and they're getting close to the end and I've journeyed with a couple of them, my grandfather being one of them, I've journeyed with a couple of them and as they get close to the end, do you remember what they say? Ian, I'm going home. I'm going home. To me, that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of someone who has spent their life knowing Jesus, getting intimately acquainted with this plan and understanding so clearly that death is just one small moment in that plan. This idea of going home reminds us that right now, right now is not the point. Right now is temporary. Right now isn't home. It gives us perspective to not, not value the now too much. Right? It also gives us perspective that a lot of people out there, they have a different end. They may not have the going home call that we know through Jesus. And we got a job to do. We have a job to do. So, what does this phrase, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
How does that help us this week? Well, if you're struggling with your identity, who you are, who you were made to be, your purpose, why are you here, what is the point of life? Maybe you're struggling with pain. Maybe life is beating you up. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with sickness or unwellness or even death. Maybe the chaos of the world around you is closing in and, and, and just the COVID and everything around you is too much. The chaotic and broken nature of our world is overwhelming you. Then you need to spend some time with the Father Almighty, the Creator. He has the answers to these problems. He has the answers to some of these questions. If you would like to go deeper with God, the Father, Almighty Creator, here's some suggested scriptures for you. Psalm 139. Psalm 139 reminds us that God made us, intimately knows us, counts every hair on our head. If you are wrestling with identity this morning, Psalm 139 brings really, really good purpose to your life. It helped me when I was in a time of crisis in my life. Psalm 23 reminds us that God cares for you and leads you through the valley of the shadow of death, through the hardships of life. God, our God is not one who is distant and says, well, I guess you better figure that out on your own. Too bad, so sad, sorry, see you later. No, our God leads us beside still waters. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't leave us on our own. Psalm 37 reminds us that if we trust in God and follow him, he will make our path straight. He will give us the good life. Notice I said good life, not easy life. God doesn't promise the easy life. He promises the good life. Ephesians 1, 1 to 14 if you're struggling with self-identity and self-worth, or even with your salvation, Ephesians 1, 1 to 14 says, God knows you so much, he chose you before the world was created. He intentionally made you and saved you. God loves you so much, and he's not letting go. He's not letting go. Revelation 7, 9 to 17, if you're wrestling with what comes after the death, if you're wrestling with that, Revelation 7, 9 to 17 gives us this beautiful picture of the saints robed in white, gathering together, singing praises and glorifying God in this beautiful city. Now, I barely understand Revelations, like I'm not going to claim to be a scholar on this, chap on this book at all, but what it does for me is it gives me this image, this picture of togetherness and closeness with our Savior. Ah, oh, I'm looking forward to that. So if that's you this morning, and these are things you are wrestling with, God, the Almighty, Good Father, Creator, He has some stuff for you. He has some stuff for you. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, it is my prayer and my heart that as we get to understand and know your Father, as we understand the Creator, the Almighty God, would that transform us? Lord, would you remind us who we are? Would you remind us why we are here? We're not here because of a cosmic accident. We're here because you made us. And you didn't just make us just for an experiment. You made us to love us. And so that we would love you and that we would love others. Lord Jesus, remind us of that daily. Remind us that we are image bearers. We bear the image of the almighty God. Remind us of that and remind us that everyone else around us does too. May we, may we remember that in our interactions and in our love of the other. Even the people that maybe are hard to love or we disagree with or we don't get along with, Lord, would you just remind us, say, hey, 
I made that person too. You don't get to treat them that way. Jesus, as we go this week, for those of us that are wrestling with feeling lost and alone and like we're tumbling in the wind, Father, come and center us. Remind us that you love us. Remind us that you lovingly created us. Remind us that we have a purpose and that we're valued. And Lord, for those of us who are wrestling with the brokenness of this world, whether it's sickness or death, would you remind us that death is not the end? Would you remind us that you have given us a story beyond death? You have a plan and that we can take hope in that. Lord Jesus, after you remind us of all of those things, may you embolden us to go tell everyone else. God, there there's so many people wrestling in this broken world that don't have hope. Send us. May we be the hope. May we share God, the Father, the good Father, almighty creator with them. May we give that story to them, share that hope, be that light on a hill to Weyburn, to Saskatchewan and beyond. Send your people, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.